Hello everybody and welcome to another On the Workbench session. Something a little bit different here. This is actually from Righteous Steel Miniatures. Good friend of mine, Ian. We've, we met at ReaperCon, oh my goodness, five, six years ago. And he was sort of my spirit guide through the process of ReaperCon and what went on there. And now he's making himself some resin miniatures, I believe, in concert with Bobby Jackson. So this is a really nifty little thing right here. Again, it's a resin miniature. It's mm, maybe 35, 30-ish millimeter scale, something like that. And what we'll do is we'll do a little bit of object source lighting here. We got some other green stuff, world flaming skulls. We got other skulls here. This is actually part of the base. So these skulls here, your tombstone type of thing. So I just decided to extend that a little bit, add some other skulls and you get the picture, see it all it extends all the way out to here, so it is an oval base. And that's why he's sitting on a one of these MDF wooden bases like so. Since this is kind of the anniversary of ReaperCon, that first one all those years ago, we're gonna stick with the Reaper paints. We're gonna use some of those typical liner paints that you see all the time. We'll be using some of the clears, like the clear yellow. Probably have clear red out here too. Now we will have, right here, this is that Mecca Vallejo orange fluorescent. Again, super thin, not like, I really like the other stuff better, but this is what showed up, and we'll use this. And we might use also, again, just continuing that substitute for the Maiden Flash. We've got this cadmium skin and the orange fire. Probably won't be using our little vats over here because I don't think we're going to be using any of the inks or the contrast paints, anything like that. We are going to be using our vintage number eight round craft brushes and as always from Hobby Lobby $4.99 and there's 12 of them. Now they take a few different forms in a way so here I'll show you one that's been worn down a little bit and now we've sort of turned it into a filbert brush, but see it still has that chisel edge on there? Look at that. So again, it offers us some interesting control. But you can also have the, what would you say, the pristine brush has more of that sharp point to it, especially when you've got it. Let's get one here that's a little bit more of a point to it. You know, just kind of got brushes scattered all over the place right now. Yeah. I really love these things because they hold a whole bunch of paint and like I said they have a nice fine tip if you need it. Palette's the same piece of chamois, piece of parchment paper inside a Chinese food container. What we'll do is we'll throw out some of those paints on the palette and we're going to get into those initial glazes and shaded base coat. You'll see a lot of browns and grays. Thought that's another interesting thing that that sort of muted color. There'll be a little bit of non-metallics here, which could be fun with the flames on the underside of the sword. Kind of, oh, what do you know? Strategically placed right there. So we'll be right back with our initial glazes. We've got those colors out on the palette, and it's time to get a move on here. Now I think this time around I am going to utilize my makeup sponges here. I haven't done that in a while. So let's do that again. Now, I'm just going to fool around here a little bit with the base first. And we've got the sepia liner, brown liner. And you notice that's not completely mixed together. That's sort of an intentional thing. Here we are. We're going to take a little bit of red liner in some places. And the idea is just to get this. It's that pre-shading. Now, we did prime this with the Badger Steinal Res, as always. There is a little bit of shading going on there, but this is going to accentuate that even more. And we'll just vary that color across here. We're going to go more brown liner in some places. Maybe even a little more with the red liner in other places. It's not going to be 
really noticeable. Just when you sit there and look at it, you want to say, aha, uh -huh, that's where I use the red liner. Oh, look, that's where I use the brown liner. But it is a subtle thing, and it will, it, it's handy. Yeah, I know we got the flame skulls there, but I need to get just some paint in there right now. And we're just going to wipe some of that away. Again, it's going to, this process is a little more vigorous, so it does kind of shake the table a bit. I'm hoping in sometime in October to do a, a studio rearrange here and potentially have a different table, one that might not shake quite as much and actually give me a little more space. So see how we've accentuated that shading. Uh, it's it's pretty obvious you got the miniature here and this over here. So now as far as that his cape goes, I'm gonna do something here with a mix of the blue and brown liners. Done an awful lot of stuff that's brown lately and I thought, what if maybe I could do something that's more of a grayish type tone? And here's the other thing, too. You're wanting to show that sky, uh, not the sky earth, but the object source lighting, that fire. Well, it makes sense that you would want cooler colors, not just darker, but cooler colors to balance that against. And that's why we've gone more with the the bluish but we are regulating that a, a bit with the the brown liner now let's get another sponge here and I don't want to take off too much let's see we leave plenty plenty enough behind let's get some more here Oh, like that. Oh, the heck with it. I'll just cover the belt. It's not that big of a deal. And this can even go over his metal stuff, too. Believe it or not. Mm, yeah. I'll just keep going here. Remember, this is all just a, a backdrop color. It's an underlayment, an underpainting, whatever you want to call it or think of it as. Now we could cut these sponges, and I've shown this in the past too. Just cut them like so. Here, let's make a couple of different shapes here. That makes it a little bit easier maybe to get at some of these areas. And here we go. Let's mm, do some more of the, just the straight up brown liner here. And the reason I'm just establishing the darkest colors I can is I want to know how much leeway I have with the fire effects here. Because if this can't get as dark as I think it should be, well, maybe I have to take a little different, maybe back off some of the, the fire effects or whatever. Some of that glue... Again, the advantage of the big old brushes here, we just we get this stuff filled in. This is just the, as I call it, the, the shaded base coat. I had to come up with a name, and there is shading on there, but to me it's just a base coat. And it seemed to fit the bill as far as describing what it was. Here, I'm just going to throw this on here, and then we'll wipe some of it away. Now, uh, what always tends to happen is people, they they can usually be kind of horrified at the, the large brushes and the taking the paint away, and it just looks like a huge mess. And, and when they try it, they realize that it's kind of liberating, that they're not so hung up on every layer must be perfect. It, they start to relax a little bit more. They... The, creative juices have a little more chance to simmer and do stuff because they're not so worried about every last brushstroke and color. That's sort of what this is meant to be. Now I do have some other 
makeup sponges like this. And let's say now this one has a lot of undercut type areas here. So maybe I use this to get at some of those. I could have tried to craft the other sponges into a shape that could reach there, but these already do it on their own. Now I'm going to take that mix of the yellow or the sepia liner and the brown liner and we'll just go over boots and pants and everything down here. Again, none of this has to be a final color. All we're trying to do is get the primer out of the way. That is sort of the first order of business. Is This wasn't white at all, but still we just wanted to take it away from anything that resembled white. And we'll do the same thing. We'll just remove in places. And even as it is, you can already start to see some of that sheeting come out. Also lets me figure out what really should be metal. What should be, oh, what would we say, a, a leather? Yeah, I think we're looking at mostly just leather. And... I just want to get this dark right here. Just get it out of the way. It's not going to end up being blue and brown liner ultimately, but I just want that like so. Now I can go back in and maybe start to darken a few areas here on the base. You can see now I've just I've already got me a nice palette sludge going. Look at that. We got reds and browns and palette sludge is a great color. Now you don't necessarily want just nothing but palette sludge on the miniature. You want that to be <laughs> targeted. So as that sort of dries, what I'm going to do is go over here and start to lighten this up because we have to set up our fire effects and we do that because of the the way this mecha stuff works versus the much thicker Vallejo fluorescent paint I have to approach this in a different way so what we're doing is we're setting up the fluorescent paint for later well, essentially almost put a glaze over the top of this, but we're just, this is a little bit different way of establishing our lighting effects here. Now we're going to definitely have that be a little more intense here. We have a lot of nice rough texture in our ground. And you can see that. i only go so far with this before start to work in a little bit of the fluorescent. Now I might even throw some of the clear yellow out here at this point, but there are some areas that are closer here. I'm already starting to think about my reflections on the metals. They would just, because they're metal, they're more prone to pick up that reflection. So all I'm doing here is just trying to figure out, okay, which of these surfaces really would have any kind of a glow on them. So let's do that. A little bit of clear yellow. We already have the clear red out there. There's a little of that, a little of the clear red. And we're also going to throw in a touch of the fluorescent. Now we still have a fair amount of wet paint sitting around in here. Uh, yeah, it's going to mix in some places with what I'm putting out here now. It's yeah, not a big deal. What the heck? I'm going to reflect some of that on the beard. And then I'm going to go back down here to the base. And as I said, there will be other stuff over the top of this we're just 
just looking to establish where I want things to be. How? What's the ex the distance that I want this thing to go? Now, there's the real or whatever, you know, the reality of, well, you know, it would only have this much of a glow. Well, that's that's great, but the miniatures really aren't reality. They're supposed to be fun, fantasy-type things, so it's that balance of you want to have a few things that are realistic to just make it, the setting more believable, but ultimately it's a tiny little figure that's barely a little over an inch of an eighth tall and you want to make it as interesting as you can so you just see a little bit of lighting under here there are a lot of nifty little details here so see on this side not so much over here now ooh, let's go in with our I'm going to this mint green, there's several of these different seafoam green colors. I've got three of them that are seem to be virtually alike almost. And what we will do now is on the other side here, let's make that a tad darker. You can almost make it like, oh, there's some moonlight or whatever. So we're going to make this light here to add more towards the blue. See how that starts to even this all out because where we had taken some of the paint away there was a sudden transition from kind of dark to wow really light and all of a sudden that goes away a little bit so you can take some of that wet so the initial wet glaze in there it's still in there hey we maybe we do a little bit of wet blending with it we can do some mud spatters too on this I I think it just depends what time allows if it does, I'll try and do some mud spatters for you. You know, I'm even going to say that this gets to be a little bit that that bluish leather. Why not? I haven't really done something like that in a while, so I'm going to have some fun with that. Okay. This is what I love about the larger brushes here set I go into I, go, I just call it filbert mode and I'm using some directional strokes it's almost like I'm using oil paint I mean not quite in that this will be dry just in a matter of a few minutes and that that nifty wet blending opportunity will go away but while it's there it's fun and what's gonna let me do that it's working with the bigger brush more open like this. Yeah, you can see that stuff's already drying. It really dries fast. Getting in as much of that blue as I can here. And now oh, let's get some on his shoulder there too. Let's lighten that up. And if this were to get too, let's say it's too blue, well, that basically the maiden flesh substitute there, that, what was it called, the uh, cadmium flesh, cadmium skin, you mix a little bit of that into this. I'm going to get lighter also, but definitely will, that little bit of reddishness to it will take it off of the, the blue. But now we're going to have also a bit more of a contrast with now speaking of which I'm gonna do that right here for on the this headstone type thing because we don't want it to be too blue but I want it to have a, almost a bit of a moonlit cast to it I think that was what I originally visualized for this it was that sort of a moonlit night type of scenario There we go. Now there's again, plenty of stuff sculpted on here. We're just keeping things as simple as possible. I do have some grass tufts that I can add. And maybe 
See as I let that bit of warmer bluish gray work its way in. Like that. Okay. I'm just gonna wanted to get a little bit of a highlight there. Well, not highlight, middle tone really. Uh, not a highlight. We got a sleeve here, I think. Yeah, for a second I thought that was actually some armor pieces, but that's really not it. And just once again, just getting a few little lights and midtones up here. Want to get some blues into this. We're keeping it simple. It's it's just the blue liner. What do we got here? Seven, eight colors, something like that. Do we really need that much more? I'd say, well, I could throw a green out there, but I have all I have this blue. I have two different blues, and I have a couple of different yellows. Do I really need to have green out on the palette? I can I can make green, and I got all the tools for making green. So I think I might just. Uh, not put any green out here at all and just see what happens. We're just going to work on this blade here. It's an interesting sort of diamond shape weapon. It's not a typical sword. It's, it's more of a dagger type of a thing. I think that might be more of a gold or brass or bronze. It's something else besides just that bluish color. You can see where you start to hold the brush on its side, start to pick up some different highlights here. I can always glaze over the top of that. You can see how we use these sort of oblique brush strokes here, just sort of on the side. We're trying to capture some of that texture. This is not a dry brush. It may look that way, but as you can see, there's plenty of paint on that brush. Not a dry brush. Definitely not at all. And I just, this is almost more of a skin color right here that I just grabbed. So while I'm thinking about it, I will just throw that here. We will do some glazes over that too. So it looks like he's got some additional daggers and such over here. It, it's a different type of figure. Now I think you know, he may cast this one again, but maybe on a more of a round base. Although Kathy has one of these, and she'll be eventually painting one of these. And it's I made a round base for it, much smaller round base. All I did was just cut off part of this base here, and then sort of made it a little bit taller, so it really looks like he's almost like he's leaping, maybe over some kind of stones. Like here, yeah. I'm gonna get back into my bluish mid-tone slash highlight color again, but it's, it's again mitigated by a touch of that maiden flesh slash cadmium skin. And now I am making myself a little different brown here for the hat. It's nice and dark as you can see. It's essentially the sepia liner mixed with that Vallejo orange. And it's going to bring some of his beard back in here and some shadows on the eyes. We will get some of our, our 
whatchamacallit, uh, optic source lighting mix in here, maybe, a tad. I also have some, and this is something that is proving to be more and more interesting as far as doing stuff like the lighting effects, it is the Creature Caster Pro Acryl Monument, whatever the heck you want to call them, paints. Let's throw a little bit of that out here, because they cover, they really cover very well, so just a little of that can go a long way. And just looking to brighten this up because we've got it. We figured out where we want it to go, pretty much the extent of how far we want that to be. And now it's time to formulate that a little more. Going to mix some of the fluorescent with that. And most likely, I'll be taking some of the, what is that, the clear red, mix it with that fluorescent, and we'll do probably some glazes there over the top of this in places. I'll tone it down. Here, even a little more of that. Now, this is, I don't know. To me, it's it's not really an advantage, the fact that it is more liquid here. I'd rather just have the more solid cohorts. It's a little easier to manipulate it, move it around in the areas we need it to. So like I said, none of this is, is what your... None of it is your final answer, sort of. That kind of... A, it's We've got more to come yet. Much more on the way. But we need to... Especially... This is an interesting area. How much of this do we want right here? It's, it's more interesting if it extends up to there in real life. Would the glow of this fire really reach that high? Most likely not, and I'm sure there will be plenty of people that would tell you when you do this and show it to them that no, 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 that never should have reached that. Well, when when they paint their own miniature, they can do it exactly the way they want, and that'll be fine. So I think you can see how this is starting to build up. So let's increase our bright a bit and uh, even I had to avoid the temptation to get too much into glowy things too quickly it's, it's a tough temptation to avoid I gotta say But remember the metals now here we're not gonna do so much of that because well fire's on the other side. Speaking of fire on the other side, I am gonna darken this down because we got you must have dark to show light. And that's what we're doing here. We're just making that side a little bit darker so that it shows up a bit more. And this is now going to be a little bit more red. And I want these to be a bit more red. A little less of the orange all the way up here. Have it be more of a reddish glow. And we'll see how that starts to... It extends out the fire effect a little bit, or the lighting effect a little bit, but yet tones it down at the same time. We're doing kind of dual work right here. And I'll just, again, fade this out a bit. Here, let's 
start to think about. Now that might be, and then it might be just too reddish on the ends of those flames there. Maybe we'll go that dark afterwards, but I still haven't even gotten the lightest part yet of my fire, so I don't want to necessarily start darkening things down. Okay. Gonna grab again some of the yellow, mix it with the orange. Getting our, our fire going here. We really have to light this up if we want to make that glow elsewhere believable that's sort of further away. That means we got to make sure that this is nice and bright. But uh, the lighter that gets, then this starts to get a little on the darker side, and that's it's not a bad thing. Temptation, though, is to get try and get back in there and, and lighten it up as much as you might have lightened stuff that's so much closer to the light source. It's, it's like anything else, the weathering, the chipping, the rust, streaks, all those sort of things that look really neat and you just you tend to want to put more of them in there because they look kind of neat again one thing we're focusing in here on stuff closest to the flame and then we back out a little bit so to me I think that is fairly decent and yes, that's I call that a shaded base coat. What we are going to do next is we'll maybe not do this, but we are going to put some refinements here on the base and in the in the coat. We'll just call it as coat, gloves, that sort of thing. So we'll be right back with that. Believe it or not, I want to get in here with some more darks. That sounds maybe a little crazy. Wait a minute, you don't have enough dark in there already? Oh, we can we can squeeze in some more here. There's a few places we're targeting. Now, actually, I'm thinking of, as I do this, I'm, I'm thinking of doing some of the weathering powders and stuff down here. That might be kind of fun. I'll just throw out some of our homemade grass tufts because hey we made those for a reason so let's do that now we'll use some of our homemade grass tufts now while I've got it here I am going to get a little more light onto these rocks and skulls and and some of these different surfaces here now let's say you want to paint this up as marble or whatever that's fine. What we are also going to do is throw out some of our usual maggot white. We haven't used that in a little while. I'm just going to toss that over here so we have it. And that's going to make things a little bit not just lighter, but give us some here, some cooler colors to work with, like so. And yes, I promised there'll be some more darks. But I just noticed some other areas that it doesn't matter how much more dark I can make it, I also want to have some lights working their way in here. You have to be, well, it's it's about being flexible, that, that working back and forth. I I really just can't emphasize that enough. I know that in the miniature painting world, there's a lot of folks, they want this very mechanical, rigid process. I know there's, I don't want to label it the paint by numbers type thing, but it is definitely less free form than this. I guess we'll call it that. And 
I know some folks just that's the kind of the way the the brains are wired. Yeah, mine is wired in a different way. It's well maybe wired for chaos. Maybe that's the why whether well, is that appeal of Zinch because Zinch just likes to throw the universe around and see where it lands. So maybe if we're going to do more with the weathering powders, there, maybe I don't do quite as much with the sepia liner in there. But we are going to get ourselves some more darks in here. That was something I wanted to target there, here to the end of that barrel. Oh, some parts here. So the more I think about it, the the more I think I'll want to try try to play with some weathering powders and maybe some mud spatters i i don't really think it's been it's been a while and it's probably been on war vehicle type things we i know on the movement trays for the song of ice and fire stuff we did some weathering powders and all that but none of them actually ended up on the miniatures themselves it was mostly again a time thing. If if this was if it was an army that I could just if I was just painting it for a, a tournament or whatever for display, I probably would have on all of their boots and such scattered some of that same. As we just throw a little bit of a see a little red there. He's got a nice pronounced brow. Why not put something right there? Let us go back to our some of these lighter colors on the overcoat here. Not tremendously lighter. But I'm also going to throw in some other little sneaky things here. Which I'll show in just a second. I'm going to use a little bit of red liner here. And I am going to throw in some purple here. As crazy as that sounds, it's not going to register as purple. When people see that, they're just going to see it as dark. Because I know that came up, a, a question somebody asked me, uh, I think it was on Facebook posts, and it was basically, the gist of it was, so how how far do you take your black? And... Now, you guys know that there is no such color in existence on this palette. It's only used for basically this thing that goes around the edge. And even now, I don't even use black for that anymore. I kind of use a dark gray. I just I only have maybe, if you were to take all the so-called jars of black in the house, put them all together, it would barely equal one standard paint jar worth of black. Everything else is just, I don't use it. I got blue and brown. As long as I have dark blue and dark brown, I can make something like a black. I'm going to go back into this purple again. And we're going to get some of that in here too. Maybe even a little bit on his glove. Maybe even a little bit on the hat. Except the hat, I want to go almost a bit of sepia on that. You can see that I still maintain that that notion of not getting bogged down into one area. Just moving around the whole figure. Keep that line moving everywhere. Because as soon as you just get yourself bogged down into that one area, it's like you're trapped in there. I might even just do a few. A little bit right there out on the edge. Because that's definitely going to have some mud spatter and such there. I am going to now get back into that bluish color there into my sepia and, and everything that's up here. And 
Now, I know this figure is, is kind of whirling around really fast. There's there's a lot going on here. And obviously I'm moving around from one area to the next pretty fast. And as I you know, lighten this up, it's called... Jeez, it, it looks like a highlight, and it is nothing close to a highlight. It's, I guess, a barely a middle tone at this point. If you were to put any kind of a white next to this, it would just, it would overpower everything. We're essentially using a middle tone blue here to do a little bit of shading on these browns and tans up here on the hat. And part of that is to encourage that notion of maybe it's moonlight. Which means I gotta do some more of that on his glove here. Yeah, that's better. Now there's a little more, I can see more of his hand there. And I'm just going to pump the brightness again a little bit. Let's see. Ah, okay. Gonna go back in here, grab a little more of that lighter sea foam, greenish blue. Then we will go back to adding a few darks in the armor right here, just making those segments. And we're also going to hit the sword blade here. Maybe a bit under the hat. You probably won't be able to see that, so I won't focus on that too much. I also have to think about here that this might even cast a shadow here. Yeah, so let's do that. Like it's actually casting a shadow and maybe here even. All of these fun, subtle little things. Sometimes you only start to notice those as you move along in the process. Now, what if I had just painted only one part of the entire thing and no other section? Maybe I don't notice that possibility. I notice it because I'm working everywhere at once and I see a chance for maybe... Now look at that go. You know what? Maybe that would be neat if there was some kind of shadow there that was cast by the fire. When you don't have the area around it and it say nothing but primer, you, you lose all context. You have no idea. Well, you, you have an idea generally what's there, but sometimes then you won't know. Oh yeah, you know I could have done this over here. And as we do this. You know, maybe that shadow there starts to take more, it becomes a little more of an important element. And like I said, this was initially about adding darker colors. Well, it was. We added some darks, and then we saw places where, yeah, we'll, we'll go back in here with some lights. Because none of these elements here are any sort of final highlight. What's what's not on the palette right now? There is no white on the palette. What I will do is grab some of the Pro Acryl white. Because that it really is intense. Covers so well. We're certainly going to need that over here. That would probably be... Uh, 
healthy portion of the next stage is going to be just kind of finishing off the object source lighting. Now we're we're taking that blue on the other side of the sword hilt here. Couple of armor pieces. I am going to try and get myself some little few little lighter colors here for these leather straps that are holding the scabbard in place. Now I've got to think about a little bit of reflected light on the his pistol here. Gonna go back to some dark again. There. Under here. And it's a, it's a process of going back and forth. You notice one thing. I don't want to really refer to it as correcting things. Now I might do myself a little bit of a darker glaze here. Even, you see it's extending all the way even to the where the flame effects are because I want that same sort of shadow that we put up here I want something similar to that down here as well and then I'm going to take some of this blue here and we're really going to gonna add more shadow right in that spot there Okay, got metals to do right here. And the idea is that there is this line of lights that continues all the way onto his glove, all the way onto the sword hilt handle, whatever it might be. A little bit of dark there and now a touch of lighter leather colors here maybe a touch of more of an earth type of tone there there we go I'm just trying to build up a little bit of Reflected light, some of that ground color. Let's get him a his belt right there. Now I'm going to do another little bit of a darker glaze just in there. Maybe even on some parts of the hat here. So working it back and forth. I think you can now you can start to see where the you got the blue and that yellow really contrasting with each other. We don't want them to fight with each other. We just want to get some contrast and see if we can throw in a few more lights on these skulls just keeping that very limited because there's a lot of things that can take away the focus of the viewing here there's an awful lot of elements that could potentially do that
here. Thinking about yeah, this thing, I also want to get a few more lights there. Maybe even a few on the those straps. We got these smaller daggers right in here. And I'm just going to on the face here. Throw in a few little lights. This is more just to figure out what's going on here than anything else. Because we'll do the face separately there. Yeah, that's actually facing up away from where the glow is, so we are shifting that. I think you can see more towards that more of a bluish glow there. Into the glove. Highlights here. All right. So what we will do now? I'm gonna. I forgot some of these skulls over here. Let's just hit those real quick. All right. So I think the next thing we're going to do is go back to our OSO right here and, and sort of finalize that effect. Maybe do whatever darker glazes we want and add whatever lighter colors that we want. So we'll be right back with that. All right, so we're going to finalize the object source lighting effect a bit here and maybe even add some other highlights. Maybe even work on the face a little bit. Now this is that that's the white that I was telling you about from Pro Acryl. We're adding some of that to the Pro Acryl yellow. And now let's see just, uh, it, it's interesting. This is going to be so much brighter to me because of the fluorescence with the camera. It may not seem quite so bright to you, but boy, that is really, that is a big difference right there. Big time difference. And this now, all of a sudden, it makes all the other reflected light or cast light that I did in other places, now that doesn't look anywhere near as bright. That starts to really set that down in place. I am going to grab a little bit of the fluorescent, though, to have that along. And we'll maybe drop some of this here. Let's go even more with that. Grab maybe some of that orange there. I could even use the Pro Acryl orange. That would also... But we're trying to keep this as, as much into the Reaper paints as possible. I'm just bringing in the Vallejo stuff because there were many, many requests for basically Vallejo substitutes for things because we we done the GW contrast substitutes and now we're now what, what Vallejo stuff I have I will try to use see when we're just trying to find those areas along here see that it's just a line of those lights And where we've got the metals, we are going to try and emphasize those. Reflected light. I'm just trying to get a couple of dots. That's all I want along here. Not that much. Just on the bottom of this blade here, ever so slightly. I know other people, they may not 
enjoy the object source lighting stuff as much as I do. To me, it's really, really fun. It just it adds so much interest to a miniature. It makes it, to me, a lot more interesting to paint. I, I know some folks, they really don't like it, or they're very scared of it, or hopefully maybe these make you a little less scared. Uh, I will be showing... I believe I still have one of the old painting pyramid videos, the the object source lighting video that I did for that. And to me, it's there's only a few of those that you haven't seen, but to me, those are they're a window into the world of how these techniques have developed. I know that the format is really different. The camera is really different. It looks so much, it probably sounds different too. But believe it or not, that it's more about the pr seeing the process change than it is seeing the process, if that makes any sense. See now how we've, this really has some nice intensity to it. That's what I was looking for here. Maybe, just maybe, I gotta get some up here. There. Maybe not much more than that. Mm, yeah, I don't think I want to do any more back there. Now, what I will see if I can do is get some, get an eye in here. It's tough. I have to really try and get that brush down in there. And I may go back in with some glazes over the beard and such. Now here I want to get some mid-tone. Yeah, stuff you're really not even going to see in there. It's just impossible. So I'm not really going to dwell on that too much. Oh, let's take some of this blue liner and red liner, see if we can't make an eye out of it for him. Is that where you can see it? I believe so. And then a little bit of an Eyelash there. The eyebrow is pretty substantial, but we also don't want to lose our bit of a highlight on that. Thinking that maybe your fiery light source there might cast something on that. Looking to do another bit of a darker glaze there. Now I need some lighter flesh colors here. Cause I put in that, that dark there. I don't want them to look like an undead vampire hunter or something like that. So All right, now we got a little bit of differential between that and the, his face. Let's take some of this white here. Over this. Get some highlights here. Now, I think I might just do the next phase. I'll break out the the weathering powders and such and see what we can do effects wise there maybe for again for that mud effect maybe even on the the ground a little bit because we saw the neat effect that can have we're probably going to do some cut grass or our tufts right the homemade tufts we'll do some leaves on there and I want to leave enough time for that segment, so...
this again more about seeing the overall effect of things here as opposed to every last little brush stroke as I refine something as neat as it is to see I guess maybe every like the, the final refinement of things I want you to s just focus on the whole because we can all spend way more time on our miniatures at a certain point Now, I could easily, after the, the video ends here, after end the recording, I could easily spend a few more hours on this, refining some really small things. But at a certain point, that doesn't really benefit you. And There's other guys that do videos where you see every last little micro dot of a shoe painted for two hours and that that's great that's fine but that's really not the mission here that's not what I'm after it's more about giving you some additional tools and, and just some additional things to, to think about Now, I'm going to get in here. This skull over here certainly needs some more lights. Now, you saw like the one thing here where I, I realized I needed to get more of a shadow there or whatever. You know, that's a really fun thing to see. But to see me paint every last little buckle on this, maybe not so productive. Now, I would definitely rather that you be able to watch a whole nother video on some other technique or, or concept. Here, I'm going to just get a little bit on that edge there. No, that would be too bright on that glove. So I went back to some more orange. There we go. And I may even, yeah, there's a few other areas here where I might spread out some of that lighting effect. Ah, I see. Speaking of buckles, I do want to, I think, get this one. There. Maybe a touch on the underside of that. Also have to think that see his shoulder would sort of block the light that's coming up onto the, the hat right there. Here, let's little more here. I'm just trying to transition this upwards. There, the the little dip there in the sculpt of the figure, and that it's something I have to just kind of negotiate a little bit. Now back to some of the lighter white here. Now, remember we were talking about green. One of the last things that I'm going to fool around with here. See what happens. Let's play with some green. Uh, we, I'm going to see what I got here. I got some blue liner left. And we have yellow. So see, that's more of a... You thought maybe by green I meant some kind of bright Kelly green. Well, this is also green, what I just mixed here, but it's it's very gray. What are we going to do? We're going to throw that on his boots. We're going to throw that over here on the tombstone. 
we will even throw that on the pistol here and on parts of him. Some of our leathers there. Because guess what? While it is definitely warmer than, say, the the blue, it is still cooler and it's definitely much grayer. So we'll still get that warm to cool contrast, even though we're dropping down some green on here. We'll even throw some of that, too, on the, the base, although I have to remember... We're doing this, the, the leaves and the tufts and all the other stuff. See, we got some green going on over here. On this boot over here. Even into the leathers there. Even into his hat. And to me, that just that sort of finalizes that last little area of additional interest that people aren't expecting. Now we've got something that's a little bit more of a yellow-green. That'll go up here. That's going to go here on parts of the glove and on parts of the armor. Maybe even on the underside of this blade. Just the last thing you would expect. Some kind of greenish color. And I'm sure you could have 20 people look at this and 19 of them would be completely shocked to know that there was this much green added to it in this many different places. But yeah, it's just, it's what is, what are you thinking that green is? Are, are you thinking only of that super bright green or dark angels green? Or thinking about a, a whole other type of green that's a little more muted? Some cases more yellow, some cases more gray. I'm even going to put some of that green over here on his coat there. Because that just makes it a little more interesting. There. We'll lighten that up even a little bit more. Because that's for his sleeve. And you can see I'm almost doing a little few dots there. Remember our episode, that was the Painting Dark Sword episode, where we did a little bit of the dot texture there. And look what I've got here. I actually almost have kind of an orange color there. Almost like a red clay type color. And now we're just doing a little bit of... Looks like a line of this light green down it. We're also going to put some of that here. Once again, on that armor surface. Might even go a touch more on a few of around this pistol there. So that was a little surprise that I wanted to be able to execute for you. I wasn't sure if that was going to work out. <clears throat> Just the, knowing the way this this thing is, I thought, oh, you know, I think that'll work. Just again, finding a few more lights and places there. Going right along the edge of that, getting that broken highlight, if you want to call it that. And I will... Oh, I'm going to add myself a little bit of clarification there. Those got a little muddy. Then I'm going to go back into some green, but this time now we're adding, see the, the difference in temperature between these two? We got some yellow here, this now more of a bluish. 
And how do we make this green? It started out as blue liner. And we mixed it with whatever gunk was over here from our, basically from our fluorescence. So we still used, that's a different kind of pellet sludge right there. It's a whole different kind of pellet sludge. And now, down in here, this is, boy, back in the, uh, yeah, I don't want to say how long ago it was when I took oil painting classes in school. The, the teacher that we had for oil painting, he could make, this is basically a middle tone highlight. And that's what he would do. He would never have really bright highlights. All of his highlights were basically just sort of light middle tones. But he also never really had super dark colors either. That was just his way of doing things. And what this that does by basically a light middle tone being my lightest color here and being this sort of greenish color, well, it means this will, even though it has form and shape down here, sorry if you couldn't see that, it's still going to register as being in some form of shadow. Like you do. Let's get a little more just a couple of lights here on the tombstone, whatever that is. And maybe a little bit of a glaze. Because I want that to be more of a, again, a shadow because we're trying to say that this is where our central light source is. Nah. I thought I'd like that lighter dot there, and then I said, nope, don't want it there. To me, something like this really does profile that, that idea of painting the whole surface at once as opposed to just doing one tiny little part of it. And think of how much easier object source lighting is when you just work on the whole thing at once instead of just little isolated bits and pieces of it. And I don't know how much more I want to screw around with things here. I think at this point we're just going to call that as it is, and we will now get out some of our basing stuff, some of the tufts, some of the leaves, put that out here, and then maybe do some of the, some little bit of mud spatter with our weathering powders too. So we'll be right back with that. As I say that all of this is good enough for right now, it gets the job done. Wow, look at I can really see the green, see that red that's down in there, that purple. We got the tans and the greens up here that are warmer greens. That's the kind of thing that I hoped I could do around this. But now let's add some other elements to this. I'm going to set them aside here. Now, hopefully, well, the, the folks that are part of the Basing Pledge, Dark Sword, and the Army Painters, you saw me do some homemade tufts here. So we're going to try and utilize some of these. We'll see what we can do with our secret weapon pigments here. We've got the MIG MO sand and gravel glue. And we're also going to try out these. Now there's, oh my gosh, at least eight, maybe ten. You can see they're different sizes, different species of leaves, whatever. Now this is one here with a different type of leaf. They're a little bit more broad. There's some greens in here, some browns and tans, a nice little variety. They're actual real leaves. 
And we also have this. This will be our sort of a spatter brush right here. You can see this is one of those number eight rounds that has really seen some better days. So it became a spatter brush. First, though, play with some tufts here. Because remember, we are going to take the leaves and we usually put those around our tufts. You know what? I kind of like that one right there. And we can then take our paint, which is still on the palette, and we are also going to add a little bit of object source lighting to our tufts, which is always a fun thing. Now, I want to see... Yeah, I might go with that somewhat smaller one here. I always have a one of my little pins right here so that I can tamp that down. It's, now, we've got some smaller ones too, but I'm going to take that larger one maybe and throw that over here. No, that one doesn't want to go there. It's just too... It's too large, so we go with a little smaller one. Now again, we're going to take the leaves and work it around there because that's sort of what leaves do. Now this is the reason why we make smaller tufts. Like that. Again, get that stuck in there as best as we can. And do I want to do any more? I think that's it with the tufts. Now, let's go in with our leaves and sand and gravel glue. I just want to get the cap to this glue here. And I always have some other little container that I can use here. Just something like this. I'm get some of this in there. Now the, oh, actually I've got one here. This is one I've used several times. Doesn't take much of this. I mean, even that's just too much. I won't even use all that. And now we're going to get into that sand and gravel glue, and we're going to start to build up some leaves and essentially pile them up around our grass. In a way, that's sort of what the leaves would do. Now, if there's some glossiness here, like I always say, that goes away after a while. That's why I really love this stuff. So many fun leaf textures here. There. I'm just trying to make those look a little more natural. And you can play around with them for a while. Yeah, that's a better place for them. I'm going to do the same thing over here, try and get some of these guys. Now you know I didn't really fret about painting the base too much because look at how much of it we're covering with dried leaves and with tufts and everything else. I have just have made that mistake in the past of realizing that I painted all this stuff on the base only to then immediately cover it up with whatever kind of flock or leaves that I threw on the top and especially the more I start to do the things like the leaves here So it's neat to have the the rocks and the skulls and the leaves all mixed together. I, you know, especially since, ironically enough, we're getting closer to Halloween than to midsummer. I guess some folks they get kind of sad when they think about that. To me. I sort of, well, I always enjoyed September. Now, it had a tendency to be a, a nicer weather month. Probably just jinxed that by saying it. Let's see, a nice little pile of leaves there. 
I think the last few I want to do will be along that little seam we have here where the grass tuft is. I don't want them in the grass tuft, although that could, I guess, be interesting too. Now, sometimes you really got to push these things around. And, you know, I'm not going to really add too many more. I think that, well, maybe that one's just kind of floating right there. Now it's down. Here, I want to get this other leaf shape in there somehow. There. It, it it starts to remember that foreground, middle ground, background where we're creating that 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 depth, those different levels. So we've done that. We'll get that off to the side. And now this is where things get a little bit interesting. We need ourselves some kind of a you know, container here to hold some of our powders. Now this is sort of a reddish, uh, and you don't need a lot of it. A little of this can go a very long way. And I also suggest you do not spill this on carpet, especially a carpet that's lighter, because your carpet then pretty much becomes this color. Wherever you have spilled it, rubbing alcohol can clear this out a little bit. Um, sort of. <laughs> not really. Now what I am going to do is grab myself some paint here actually. I'm going to take some of the sepia liner like that. Now the other thing you could do is mix oils with this. That's kind of a fun combo but I need this to dry really fast as in immediately so that is why you see me mixing basically the acrylics and the powders together it's a little bit easier to get the two to mix together when you use the oils. You could use the rubbing alcohol for this, but then they get, they actually get less, they're not as thick anymore. And even this is a, it's not super thick. That's where, you know, the oil paints, you could really make some thick mud with the oil paints because it just, it is naturally so much thicker. Man, I'm going to go in here. Now I have to remember that this will dry much later. You can't go by what you see here. You have to go by what you know is going to happen. And that's what we're just going to... Because if he's going to have some kind of mud spatter on his clothes or his coat, well, why in the world is there... Why is that color not on the rest of the base somewhere? So here I'm actually taking a little bit of water. And the idea is to just sort of stain that leaf a little bit. Maybe even stain some of these skulls. Maybe even a little bit on that tombstone there. But again, i got to wait for things to dry. And then here on the coat. Now I can do the spatter thing also, but for right now, I'm just placing it on the coat. And in the most obvious of places too, you know, here along the edge. I'm even drying that out a little bit. See, yeah, I don't necessarily even need to spatter it. As much as we all love the mud spatter, Going to do some of that in here too. Because we got lots of folds in there, that makes that maybe a little more interesting. Yeah, you know what? We may not even need the spattering brush. I'm kind of liking what's going on right here. I don't necessarily think I need some more of that. And I'm just. Instead of this being that typical brown earth, this is a little bit more of a reddish earth color. 
See, I'm not killing all of that fun shading that we did there. Now, what I will do maybe is... Oh, what the heck, we'll... We're literally now starting to paint with the weathering powders a bit. And I'm going to add just a touch of the... See, I'm lightening up my color here a little bit. I could use a, a sponge for this. Here, instead of spatter, I'm going to use that as a stippling brush. Just a little bit of stippling here and there. Maybe a touch lighter. Take some of that excess away. And just think where the mud is higher up on the coat, it's going to be lighter because the lighter mud is dry. So see, that's working like spatters there. I just, as much as I love me some spatter, and it's weird, me, the guy that doesn't necessarily want to control every last little thing, sort of likes the control of this better. Well, I don't mind spatter when I'm just doing it on just to do it but when I'm trying to do a video and I can't hold the figure and hold the spatter brush at the same time then that sort of changes the paradigm a little bit so to me that's not too shabby and now we can even here I'm gonna get some of the lighter tan also into the dirt here hopefully that's yeah you can see that it's somewhat on the palette cam maybe take away a little more of that a little bit here see even over the skulls it it starts to make them part of the environment instead of just like somebody put Halloween decorations out here. Yeah, see, that's kind of nifty. Nice. Now, I'm going to set this aside. And remember, we wanted to maybe have a little bit of that glow onto our grass as well. And that'll be the, the last thing that we tackle here. So palette is in place. Guess what? We grab some of our yellow color here. And then we're just going to dust this over the grass. Ever so gently. I mean, I want to set the grass on fire. Let's see that little bit there and the difference that makes next to that tuft. And I will actually put a little bit of my glowing color onto the leaves there. Maybe just a couple of touches on that. So now I think we've set ourselves, we've gotten this worked out pretty well here. We got our grass, we got leaves. We have plenty of interest here on this whole base, but without subtracting from this, we have a lot of warm colors down here. We have cool colors up here. You've got the greens, purple. We got, we got essentially yellow, red, and blue, the three most important colors pretty much everywhere, even here on the metals. And some green there right in juxtaposed next to that sort of purple type color and then as we go over onto this side now this really starts to take center stage because it's funny because when you look at this side there's a lot of interest and in, and in high impact stuff going here and then you go over here and it's like boom so i hope that this gives you some ideas for other things and once again this is righteous steel miniatures i 
I can when there's a website or something like that I can link you to I'll put that link in the description okay and I'm sure there'll be I uh, that Ian will be putting some other stuff up there on on Facebook and and other things talking about his very nifty miniature so thanks to Ian for this and you know thanks to everybody that supports this I really appreciate it because it just wouldn't be possible otherwise. I'd have to just be doing commission stuff and never film any videos at all. That's just kind of how it would be. Actually, I'm going to add me a couple of leaves right here. I'm going to see if I can't do that. I'm just going to try and shove a couple of those in there. Basically right along the edge, yeah. See, that's a little bit of overhang there. That's okay. So I will catch you on the next On the Workbench session. That is most likely going to be after ReaperCon, I would say, because, well, there's just so much to do there, and that is a week-long affair. So thanks again, everybody, and I will see you later.